Amen. Well, take your Bibles tonight with me and go to Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1 as we start our second second week of our new study in the book of Romans. And last week we spent a fair bit of time just looking at the introduction. And uh, we're going to pick it right back up in verse 1 and kind of get back into the context before we delve into the text in more depth. But uh, Romans chapter 1, the very first Uh, verse of the letter. It says, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated unto the gospel of God, which he had promised afore by his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, concerning his son, Jesus Christ our Lord, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh, and declared to be the Son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. Isaac, you want to turn me down just a little bit because I'm I'm not even trying to be loud and I can hear a ringing already. So give me just a little less. I'll make up the difference. Perfect. Uh, And so uh, we looked at last week, Paul and uh, his credentials, a servant of Jesus Christ, literally a bond slave of Jesus Christ, that he is called to be an apostle, that, uh, and again, the office of an apostle is something that was was reserved for those who have been personally called by the Lord Jesus Christ. There is nobody occupying the office of apostle today. Uh, and that he was separated under the gospel of God. We looked at that, and then speaking of the gospel, that gospel was promised afore by his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, and then it says that the gospel is concerning his son Jesus Christ our Lord, made of the seed of David according to the flesh, declared to be the Son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead by whom we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name. So Paul is, uh, and, his, and those that traveled with him, uh, they, they were sent to the Gentiles. And the gospel and uh, the fact that Jesus Christ is the Son of God is declared or it's determined. Uh, we, we know Jesus as the Son of God by virtue of the resurrection. Uh, That's why we make a very big deal about Easter and celebrating the resurrection of Christ is because that is how we know Jesus is who he claimed to be. He claimed to be the Son of God. He claimed to be the Christ, the Messiah, equal with God, and the one that had been sent by God in order to uh, save man from his sin. Well, how do we know that's true? How do we know it's not Mohammed? How do we know it's not Buddha? How do we know it's not any of the other people that have claimed to be uh, the sent from God or the Son of God? The difference is Jesus, after he died, rose from the dead, just like the scriptures foretold and just like Jesus foretold, that on the third day he rose from the dead. And so they they are sent to preach. Their apostleship is for obedience to the faith among all nations, to bring nations, uh, people from every tongue, every tribe, every nationality, to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Verse 6 says, Among whom ye also are ye also the called of Jesus Christ. And so as we saw his apostleship last week, that some of these in Rome were also among those who had been the called of Jesus Christ. I want to read verses 6 and 7 and show you some titles that the scripture uses uh, for uh, believers. In verse 7 he says, To all that be in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints. And then he greets them with grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, which is a familiar greeting that uh, is used very often. In fact, in all of Paul's letters, uh, he he greets them with the grace and peace of God. But notice in verse 6 and verse 7 that the Apostle Paul uses three distinct titles to reference the saved. In verse 6, he calls them the called, among whom are uh, are ye also the called of Jesus Christ. Christ. Uh, This is a term used to describe the saint. We've been called by Jesus Christ into obedience of the gospel or obedience to the gospel of Jesus Christ. That does not mean that, that, uh, that God has chosen and he only calls certain people. No, the Bible says that God has called the entire world to repentance. The Bible says now he commandeth everyone everywhere, every man everywhere to repent. The whole world has been called, but only those who get saved become the called. And we are the called. In Romans chapter 8 and verse 28, the Bible says, We know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are 
the called according to his purpose. If you're not saved, it doesn't all work together for good. In fact, nothing works together for good. You can be like the rich man in the scriptures who had everything in the world and he feasted sumptuously and he had all those things while Lazarus was just happy to get some crumbs off the table and let the dogs lick his sores. But in the end, it all worked out for Lazarus. It didn't work out so well for the rich man. And so we are the called of God. In verse 7, he uses another term. He says, to all that be in Rome, beloved of God. Beloved of God. While God loves the entire world, John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world, and he loves the entire world. He sent his son Jesus to die for the world. It's only those who receive the gift of Jesus Christ, the gift of his love, that are called the beloved of God. The word beloved means esteemed or worthy. Now, are we worthy of salvation? The answer is no. Are we worthy of God's love? No, we are not. Are we worthy of his grace? No, we are not. But when we get saved, we are made worthy of it. Okay? I'm not anymore what I was. What I was is gone. What I am now is a child of God. I am a joint heir with Jesus Christ. I've been sealed by the Holy Spirit. I'm promised everlasting life. The Holy Spirit of God has made his temple inside of my body. There are a lot of awesome things that happen. Now, I'm not worthy of any of that happening, but when I got saved, now I am worthy. God has made me worthy. I am a child of God, and I should not drag my head and walk around in, you know, in shame and this, oh, woe is me kind of thing. Yes, I'm a sinner. Yes, I'm uh, in my flesh. I'm unworthy of it. But I'm redeemed. I, I obeyed the gospel. I trusted Christ as my Savior, and he has written my name down in the Lamb's book of life, and I am going to stand before him one day, hopefully to hear the words, well done, thou good and faithful servant. I'm going to have a place that Jesus himself has gone to prepare just for me. He's going to give me rewards and Probably, uh, you know, there's a mixture of crowns and other things for those that have served the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, I have the Holy Spirit of God who lives inside of me, sealing me into the day of redemption. I've been adopted by, the, uh, by God himself. And we understand that the sincere love and desire uh, that, that, that the Heavenly Father has towards, a, towards us in the story of the prodigal son, and that, that ungrateful, wretched little brat of a son that took his father's inheritance and went out and he wasted it all on riotous living. He wasted it on prostitutes and he wasted it on booze and he wasted it on all kinds of stupid stuff. And he comes crawling back to dad and the older brother said, he's unworthy of even being here. But you know what? Even the younger son said, I am not worthy to be called your son anymore. Just take me back as a servant and I will have a better life than I had over in the far country. Isn't that true of you and I today? To be a servant, as Paul said, a servant, a bond slave of Jesus Christ, we have it better than when we lived in sin. To be a slave of God, to be a slave of the Lord Jesus Christ, is a better life than living as a slave to sin. But we're not just Slaves, servants. We are literally, as Paul will talk about, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit in chapter 8, that we have been adopted and we have received the spirit of adoption whereby we cry, Abba, Father, Daddy, a term of endearment, a, a relationship. And when that prodigal came crawling back home, the father, when he saw him a great way off, ran to him and threw his arms around him and said, kill the fatted calf, bring me a robe, bring me a ring, draw a bath, get some shoes. This my son who was, is dead is alive again. He was lost and now he's found he's back home. He's not worthy. That son is not worthy to be called that father's son any longer except that the father thinks he's worthy. And sometimes we, we in, a, in a 
almost in a false sense of humility or in a, in a wrong sense of who we are. Yes, I'm a sinner, but I'm a sinner that has been redeemed by God. He, he thought me of such value that he sent his son to die on the cross for me. He thought me of such value that he washed my sin away. And he says, I want to come back someday and spend eternity with you. Bring, receive you unto myself that where I am, there ye may be also. So I'm worth something. I'm beloved of God. As a, as a believer in Jesus Christ tonight, I am beloved of God. I am esteemed. I am worthy in his eyes. He has made me that. So I, I don't want to walk around in arrogance with my chest stuck out saying, you know, oh, look at me. I'm a Christian. I'm going to heaven. You, you sinners over there, you're nothing. Uh, no, that's not, the, that's not the point of that. The point of that is to say, you know what? I'm not a nobody. I'm a child of the king. And I don't deserve to sit at his table, but I do. And I don't deserve for the king of the universe to hear my humble little prayers, but he does. And I don't deserve to have the Holy Spirit of God take up residence inside me, but he is. I don't deserve to walk on the street of gold, but I will. And for that, I'm not, as Paul talked about, he said, I forget those things which are behind and I press toward the mark. I'm not going to live worried about what happened yesterday and the failures of yesterday and those things. By the way, Paul also said, I don't remember the, the, the victories and the successes and the achievements that I made in the flesh either. All these things that were, I thought were gain to me, he said, now I count them as loss. I count them but dung that I may win Christ. He forgot the successes, but he forgot the failures, too. He said, I'm not looking back at yesterday. I'm not looking back to before I was saved. I'm looking ahead. I'm looking at the finish line. I'm pressing toward the mark. And this is a reminder. You are, if you're saved here tonight, you are the beloved of God. He deems you worthy. He esteems you highly because you're his child. And it's no more complicated than that. If you're a parent in this room tonight, then you understand this. There is really no other reason for us to love our children. They drive us nuts. They take all our money. They make us gray-haired. And yet we love them and we do anything in the world for them. We lay down our life for them. Well, what... What makes the little five-year-old kid worth dying for? What has he ever contributed? Nothing. What, what, is, what does your eight-year-old daughter contribute to the household income? A big red line in the budget for clothes and food and education and entertainment and all the other things? They don't contribute anything. They're a net drain. Well, why don't we throw them away? Get rid of our kids. Because we love them. Why do we love them? Because they're our kids. We love them if they do stupid things. We love them when they do smart things. When they make us proud or when they make us want to kill them. We love them. So, as a parent, sometimes you want to kill your kids because you love them. And you just figure, me taking them out of this world would be the best thing for them at this particular moment. But we don't. We love them. Why do we love them? What did they ever do for us? My kids put my wife through nine months of misery both times. Capping it off with invasive surgery to bring them into the world. Two weeks of not being able to drive, not being able to go upstairs. And we did that to our parents. And they love us. Why? Well, you're my son. I love you. You're my daughter. I love you. By the way, those are the only two options. And it doesn't change. <clears throat> 
when they're born, it doesn't change between then, then and death. You're my son. You're my daughter. I love you. Sometimes it's like, Dad, I don't know why you love me. No, I love you because you're my son. God loves us because we're his children. It's just no more complicated than that. He loved us when we were his enemies, enough to send his son to die for us. He loves us. How much more does he love us now that we're his children? We're beloved by God. And because of that, it makes us worthy to sit at the table. It makes us worthy of the robe. It makes us worthy of the ring. It makes us worthy of the shoes. It makes us worthy of his attention and his time and his affection. Why does he love us? Because we're his children. It's just that simple. We're beloved of God. And then he says, called to be saints. The word saint is very closely associated with the word holy. And it has the idea of those who have been separated to God's service. By the way, the church does not determine sainthood. On June, or July 1st, 1983, when I knelt at the altar and I asked the Lord Jesus Christ to save me, I became a saint. I was separated by God from my old sinful life for who I used to be. I, I was separated to God's service, to a new life, to a new way of thinking, to a new way of doing things. The idea of being a saint also carries with it the sense of being morally pure, being clean, being acceptable for use. As a saint, I, it's a title, we're called by that title of saint. Uh, and, and that idea of being a saint means that God has some expectations on us. It's much like we, we raise our children. I know we, Chris and I raised our two children. Uh, you're a dolky. Act like one. Do the family proud. Don't bring shame to the name. Don't bring shame to the family. There's some expectations because you're our child, because you're in our family. We have some expectations on how you're going to live. Other parents may not have these expectations on their children, but we have them for ours. And God says, I've called you to be saints to live a different life, a life that is associated with the holiness of the God who called you that. So we have three titles. You know, isn't it funny how we often just skip over these first, first handful of verses in these letters? Yada, 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 whoever, whatever. There's so much doctrinal truth in, in these greetings that Paul makes. Even in the end of his letters, there's oftentimes some very doctrinally deep things that just you, you just kind of skip over. Yeah, whoever, I don't know who this person is, whatever, whatever. But we are the called of Jesus Christ. To all that be in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints, and the greeting of grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace and peace. Of course, uh, as Brother Pierce preached this morning uh, about God's grace. We have God's grace in our life. Not the grace that saved us. Okay, we're saved by grace through faith. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. We're saved by grace through faith, not of works. But that grace that saved us is the grace that gives us the ability to serve God and to live up to what we have been called to be, which is to be saints, to be holy, to be clean to be usable. And he always starts out with grace. May the grace of God be with you. And George Lucas, I think, stole that from the Bible. May the force be with you. Well, in the Bible, we say, may the grace of God be with you. By the way, the grace of God is more powerful than the imaginary force in Star Wars. The grace of God is such that it can breach through even the most sinful heart and bring even the most rebellious, stubborn, wicked sinner like a man named Saul to the saving knowledge of Christ and turn him into the writer of Scripture and the 
the, probably the greatest of the apostles in what we know he did for the Lord Jesus Christ. How many men he trained for ministry. How many churches he started, he established, he, he developed, he, he brought to maturity through his time. How he traveled among the Gentiles, even though his heart's desire was that, that he would see his own people saved. God sent him out to a Gentile people, and he tried to witness the Jews everywhere he went, but God had called him to the Gentile people. And he had to live among the Gentiles, and he had to talk to the Gentiles, and he spoke more Greek than Hebrew in his time of ministry because he spoke to Gentiles more often than he did to other Jews. And God brought him from being a persecutor and a hater of everything to do with Jesus Christ to one of the greatest servants of Jesus Christ that there ever was. Think of that again back in verse 1. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ. It wasn't that many years before he wrote that that he was receiving letters from the Sanhedrin to go to Damascus and to find any... And, and they wouldn't even use the name Christ or Christian. They called them of that way because they didn't want to use the name of Jesus or Christ. They want to dignify their claim that Jesus was the Messiah. So they called them of that way. I'm going to go any of that way, any of you use that name. I'm going to pers- I hate that name. That name is antithetical to everything I believe in. And then 15 years later, Paul is writing, I'm a servant of not that name. I'm a servant of Jesus Christ. Well, how do you get there? You get there through the grace of God. The grace of God is powerful. And by the way, the grace of God is not there so you can live how you want. The grace of God is there so you can live like God wants you to live. Live up to your calling, which is that of a saint. Called to be saints. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm not going to spend a lot of time in this because he uses this in every, every Pauline epistle that we study. We could spend a long time in this. We're not going to here. The book of Romans, there's so many other things that we'll spend time on. We've talked about this, but you think about God's peace. The grace, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. If there's two things we as believers need... More than anything else, we need grace and we need peace. When we are suffering and we are infirmed and when we have a weakness, his grace is sufficient to overcome that. There is no reason for a believer not to serve God because even in our weakest state, his grace allows us to do something, even if it's to lay there, immobilize in a hospital bed, and to pray for missionaries and to pray for pastors and to pray for the church and to pray for their lost friends and their lost loved ones. There's something that you can do and the grace of God can overcome whatever debilitating physical ailment that you have, the grace of God can get you over that. But also when there's external pressures, when there's persecution, when there's ridicule, when there's difficult and trying circumstances, when there's financial trouble, when there's a pandemic, when there's whatever going on, it's the peace of God that passes all understanding that gets you through that. When the storm is raging around you, did you all get the storm yesterday? Man. The tree in our backyard, I mean, I'm surprised there's a leaf on it. I mean, it was just, it looked like the thing was getting ready to get up and go running down the street. I mean, it was it was blowing hard and the rain was coming down. It was like, it looks like a hurricane's coming through. Imagine being out on a lake when a storm like that sweeps in out of nowhere. And your boat's bobbing up and down and it's filling up with water. Time to hit the panic button, boys. Help! 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 Where's Jesus? Where's Jesus? He's sleeping. He's taking a nap. He must like water beds. Rocked him right to sleep. 
The disciples are pitching stuff overboard. They're in a panic. They think they're all going to die. They come down yelling at the Lord, waking him up. Come on, Jesus, we're all going to die. What are you doing out here sleeping? Wakes up. Calm down. It's going to be okay. And what does he say to the storm? Peace. Be still. This peace passes all understanding. The disciples were totally freaked out by what he did. They said, what manner of man is this that even the winds should obey him? The winds and the seas obey him. His peace blew them away. When Paul and Silas sat in prison, having been beaten within an inch of their life, illegally under Roman law and unlawfully thrown into prison, the peace of God came over them. The grace of God was enough to overcome the stripes on their back, but the peace of God was enough to overcome the injustice they had suffered. And so they just sat back and sing, sang and preached. I struggle to find anywhere in the record of the Apostle Paul's ministry that he was ever not at peace. The grace of God and the peace of God overcame the thorn in the flesh, overcame the beatings, overcame the shipwrecks. I mean, two weeks they had been out on this ship being tossed by the wind. That's what the scripture says. Two weeks they had been trying and trying and trying and trying. And God had told, told them, told Paul, don't go. And then God comes to him in the midst of this storm and says, the ship's going down, but nobody's going to die. And when all hope was lost, Paul shows up on the deck of that ship and he says, uh, number one, sirs, you should have hearkened unto me. I told you this was a bad idea. You should have listened. And number two, it's going to be okay. Nobody's going to die. You don't see Paul flipping out. You don't see Paul in the jail flipping out. You don't see Paul picking himself up off the garbage dump outside of the city and saying, time to panic. You see a man who's just surrounded by the peace of God. He was probably one of the most peaceful men until he started preaching. I just imagine him being... I'll put it this way. A lot of times when we picture the Apostle Paul, we picture somebody who's vibrant and, you know, young and good-looking like, like me. And, you know, I'm just, no, just kidding. <clears throat> we picture somebody who's, you know, who's, who's got it together. And, and you, this guy comes waltzing in and he strolls into the church. You just know that's the Apostle Paul. And everyone's just in awe of him like Eliab was when Samuel went to anoint David and he saw Eliab and he said surely this must be the Lord's anointed he looks like a king <clears throat> I think the apostle Paul probably looked and this is not um, I would say this if he were here he probably looked a lot like your father-in-law Charlie and he probably needed somebody to guide him around because he couldn't see very well. I personally believe he couldn't see very well. Scripture seems to indicate that he couldn't see very well. He, wrote, he only wrote, as far as I know, one of the epistles in the New Testament with his own hand. And it wasn't a very long one. He said, see how long of an epistle I've written with my own hand? He didn't write much. He needed help. He needed people to guide him around. He was not very good all on his own. And I imagine a man who has suffered all the things that he's suffered and been through all the things he's been through and his body is, is broken and it's damaged and it's weak and it's frail and yet he would stroll in and he would, he would make his way up to the front of the room in which he would preach and somebody would guide him to the pulpit. <clears throat> they would go sit down and the grace of God would overcome all of those ailments. And he would preach to that church with such power and with such authority given to him by the Holy Spirit and the apostleship he had been called to that people were just in awe of him. 
when he gathered the Ephesian elders together to say his goodbye and told him that he would see their face no more, they wept. They loved him and were broken that they would not see him again. And yet Paul was not in despair over that. I won't see you here. I will see your face no more, but I'll see you again. He just kept going on. Why? Because he had grace and he had peace. He had the two things every believer needs in great abundance. The grace of God to overcome our physical weaknesses and the peace of God to get us through the external trials of our life. So he says in verse 8, First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all, that your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. You know, as the Apostle Paul went around preaching and teaching, he set an example. He, sent, he expressed personal messages in pretty much all of his letters. and These personal greetings uh, really show some personal habits in the life of the Apostle. Things that we know to be true of the Apostle Paul because it's evident in the writings that God inspired him to write. And I do believe the personality of the writers was always in view in the way the Holy Spirit inspired them to write. There's a difference in writing between Paul and Peter and between John and Peter. You can see it. You can read it. Even though it's all inspired by God. And in fact, the Apostle Paul in a couple places, uh, in 1 Corinthians in particular, where he said, I'm, I'm saying this by permission, not commandment. The Holy Spirit's letting me write this down. But I haven't been told I have to write it down. I'm saying this with permission, not commandment. That's pretty amazing. Kind of like when Moses spoke to God face to face as a man talketh with his friend and the glory of God was just absorbed in his face so that he comes off the mountain and he has to wear a veil because his face is glowing. And God puts him up in the cleft of the rock and allows his glory to pass by and once his glory has passed by he removes his hand and allows Moses to see his hinder parts. And he was called a friend of God they had a special and unique relationship. I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all that your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. In verse 9 he says, For God is my witness whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his Son, that without ceasing I make mention of you always in prayer. We see some habits in the Apostle Paul's life. First of all, he was thankful. In verse 8, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all. And what does he thank them for? He thanks them for the fact that their faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. Do you know that in every, epo every epistle that Paul wrote, he expressed gratitude for that church or that group of people he was writing to, except for one. And that was the Galatians. Because in Galatians chapter 1 and verse 6, he said, I marvel that ye are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel. They had perverted and changed the gospel that had once been preached to them, and Paul, that was the only church Paul never said that he was thankful for. He was thankful for the carnal Corinthians. He was thankful for the Ephesians. He was thankful for the young preachers, Timothy and Titus. He was thankful for uh, men like Philemon. He wasn't thankful for the Galatians because they had abandoned the trueness, the, the simplicity of the gospel. Paul is thankful for other believers. And because they exhibited such a profound faith in the Lord uh, that God inspired him to write, I thank my God. And you know if the Holy Spirit had him write that down, that Paul had to literally thank God for them because of their faith, spoken of throughout the whole world. In churches today... And I learned this lesson a long time ago in the ministry. I wish they had taught this in Bible college. I know I have talked to Casey about this. And I have talked to other young preachers when they start out in ministry. And this is usually, they say, what's the one thing, pastor, that you, you could give me advice on, you know, as a pastor or as a missionary or whatever? And usually my advice to them is this. Don't waste your time trying to get carnal people to be spiritual. It's a waste of time. Because that's something each person chooses for themselves. 
what often gets pastors into trouble is they get frustrated because of carnality in the church. And so they preach a message designed to spank them into being spiritual like they want them to be. And it, all it does is make them mad and they leave the church. Because they're preaching with a target in mind. They're preaching to nail somebody. They're preaching, get in the pulpit and rip somebody. And, you know, we're going to deal with this and whatever else. You know, if it's a widespread problem in the church, then it needs to be dealt with from the pulpit. If it's a personal problem that somebody's having, it should be dealt with in private. I don't need to, if, if somebody in the church is, is in some kind of sin, I don't need to get up and rip everybody and slobber and spit and climb all over the pews about it. I can deal with that brother to brother, brother to sister. But if there is genuine carnality in the church, yeah, I want to get up and I want to preach, but I can't make, if you're carnal, if you love the things of the world and church and the things of God are kind of a second thing to you and they're not the most important thing and you can kind of take it or leave it and you come when you feel like it, there's, I, I'm, I have, there's nothing I can do for you and I don't spend a lot of time on you and I don't spend, I pray for you, but I don't spend a lot of time trying to figure out how to get you, what program could we do to make them spiritual? Uh, what, what thing could I do? What could I say from the pulpit that would get them to realize they need to be spiritual. It's not my job. You know who I preach to? I preach to the people who want to hear the word of God, who are spiritual in their decision making. Those are the ones that will respond to it. A carnal man is not going to respond to the gospel unless the Holy Spirit convicts them and they say, you know what, I'm willing to surrender today. But it's not my job to bring conviction. And that's what, where a lot of preachers get themselves into trouble. And they managed to grow churches of two, three, four hundred people down to like 20. Because they're preaching from the flesh, trying to convince people and yell at people and berate and browbeat people into being spiritual. It'll never happen. Don't waste your time. Paul thank, was thankful for them that their faith was spoken of throughout the whole world. These were believers. These believers in Rome were people who had a spiritual desire about them. They were spiritual in their nature. They were spiritual in their mindset. And so when they, they went about life, they went about life from the perspective of a spiritual person, not a carnal person. They didn't make decisions about how they were going to live their life based on the culture. They didn't make decisions about how they were going to make, live their life based on uh, the Roman government. They didn't make decisions about how they were going to live their life based on their parents. Uh, they didn't make decisions based on their pastor. They made decisions about how they were going to live their life based on what they knew of the word of God and what they knew of God himself. That relationship with God influenced them to live the life that they did. And when you live for God, not for your pastor, not for your parents, not for your Bible college, not for the praise of men, not for worried about what they're going to write in the sword of the Lord about you, not for any of that stuff. If you just live for God, then there's no limit to what he can do with you and through you. And who cares what anybody else thinks about? I'm living for God. Now, if you're violating God's word, you're not living for God. No matter how much zeal you have, you have a zeal, but not according to knowledge. You need to know the book so you know where to direct that zeal to serve God. Because God will never lead you to do anything that violates that book. <clears throat> okay? I want to win the nudist colonies to Christ, so I'm going to strip naked and go out there on the beach with them. No. No. That is contrary to scripture. Win them when they put their clothes back on and come off the beach. Well, I want to win all those people down there at the bar, so I'm going to put on a leather jacket and go down to the bar and hang out with them. No. Win them when they come out of the bar. Win them when they're at their house. Win them when they're at work. Don't go in there and carouse and join in. And There are limits to how we serve God and live for God. But I think there's a, uh, among churches, and, and I have seen this in the various groups and thing where there's this idea that there are certain people in certain areas of Christianity that they are the self-anointed popes of these areas, and if you don't do things in your church the way they think you ought to do them, then they slap a label on you, like, okay, well, you're liberal. 
okay, well, you think I'm liberal, and you know what your opinion's worth to me? You could give me a bucket of warm spit, and I would trade your opinion back for that. That's what it's worth to me. And I've had, when, especially as a young pastor, I had older preachers try to tell me this, and this is the way I should do things, and this is how it's done, and let me tell you how it's done, son. Let me tell you how to do things. Well, your past, I'm looking at your church, and I'm not seeing life in your church. I'm seeing you running a nursing home, and, and, and by the time you're actually going to be dead, most of your church will be dead, and, and this, it, they're going to sell the building and put a strip mall there because there's no life going on there. I'm not interested in your opinion. <clears throat> By the way, even if you are running the greatest church in the world, I'm still not interested in your opinion unless I ask for it. Because the church doesn't belong to anybody except him. And what God is doing in Illinois or California or Florida or Texas or Cleveland, Ohio or Cincinnati, Ohio, may or may not be what God wants me to do in Columbus. Well, this is the way it needs to be done, preacher. Okay, well, I'll take that under advisement. Now I'm going to go pray and see if God agrees with that or not. He was thankful for their faith. <clears throat> Brother Chacon was talking to the Spanish group that was here today and explaining to them what our vision is. Our vision is simply to see from here to win people to Christ and to train them to go to other places in Columbus to start churches that are speaking Spanish, or at least go to another established church and replicate what we're doing here, but to help reach people who don't speak English with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Maybe to go to another city, go to Indianapolis, or go to Chicago, or go to somewhere, Dallas, somewhere where there's more Hispanic people that don't have a Bible preaching work, and start something there, and, and give them the gospel. Maybe go back to El Salvador, or go back to Mexico, or go back to uh, Cuba, or Guatemala, or anywhere else in the world that's Spanish speaking, and take the gospel back to that place, and try to plan a church, and try to see people come to know Christ. We are not trying to be the largest Spanish ministry in the state of Ohio or in the United States. We are not trying to make the cover of the sword of the Lord or whatever that translates into into Spanish. Sordo el lordo. We don't, I don't, whatever that is. I am not trying to start something so that people will come to Columbus and say, oh, Brother Dalkey, you're a genius. Brother Chacon, boy, what an amazing thing. Oh, you guys are great. I don't care. If nobody on this earth notices, I don't care. Because Jesus is on the throne and he's keeping score. He knows exactly how many rewards I deserve. He knows exactly how many are going to go up in smoke on Judgment Day. He knows what I do in the flesh, and he knows what I do in the spirit. He knows what I do by the grace of God, and he knows what I do by the power of my own intellect. And he's going to know exactly how to reward me on Judgment Day. And if I, as a pastor, let what other pastors or some goofball in his underwear in his mom's basement on the internet who writes a blog about independent Baptist preachers determine how I do things around here, uh, then we're in for a world of hurt. But fortunately, you have a pastor who couldn't give a rip what anyone thinks. When it comes to how we run the church here, frankly, I don't give a rip what you all think either. I only care that he's happy. If Jesus Christ is happy with what we're doing with his church, that's all that matters. And if he gives us five Hispanic people, and only five, and those five are it, and those five never, never go into the ministry, and they never go anywhere else, they just come, and they just sit under there. If that's what God gives us for the labor that we do, then that's what he wants us to have, so be it. If he gives us 5,000, if we have the day of Pentecost happen here, and 3,000 Spanish-speaking people go through the baptistry, and Brother Chacon and I are dog-tired at the end of the day baptizing all those people in the baptistry, we're just doing one of those, mat, mat, we'll just get them all down in Big Walnut down there, and we'll just go like this, and they just all dunk themselves. Let's go! Got to be smart about these things. 
if that's what the Lord wants to do here, if he wants to blow the doors off this place, if he wants to have bulldozers out here building uh, a new English building and a Spanish building and an Arabic building and a Korean building out here on the acreage we have, then so be it. If he doesn't want us to build anything out there, then so be it. I don't need the City Council of Columbus to be worried about what we're doing here. Oh, man, the whole city's going nuts. They stopped killing each other. They're not doing drugs anymore. They're getting off welfare. They're not living together and producing babies out of wedlock. They're, I mean, what, what's wrong with our city? Alcohol sales are down. Tobacco sales are down. Arrests are down. What are those people doing over there at Capital City? They're messing up our city. We need to shut them down. I don't care whether they ever know our name or not. I just want to serve the Lord. But it would be nice if someday I got a letter from somebody, another pastor or an evangelist or somebody, and said, I just want to thank God for you all because everywhere I go, they're talking about what God is doing at Capital City Baptist Church. That would be okay. I thank my God for you all through Jesus Christ, that your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. What an amazing thing. As his beloved, as his saints, deploying the grace and the peace of God to overcome the external and the physical limitations, the maladies and infirmities, there's no limit to what God can do in your life and in this church. And it was evidently happening in Rome when the Holy Spirit of God said, Paul, write them a letter. There's some things they need to know. There's some things that they don't quite yet understand. But man, are they tearing it up. Write them a letter so that they will be even better. May God do at Capital City Baptist Church something that will blow the doors off this world. Not, not for the praise of men, but for his glory alone. May we just live as saints. We've called to be it. Might as well live like it. Let's enjoy the fact that we're beloved. We are the called. And that his grace and peace is all that we need. Let's stand together for prayer. Heavenly Father, I thank you that uh, through Jesus Christ,